All right, hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to be talking about the brain. Uh, simply put, uh, when we are talking about the brain, one of the things that I want to recognize is that um, uh, everything that you do, uh, everything that you believe, everything that you think, every emotion that you feel um, is an aspect of the brain. Um, and so that's what we're going to be studying uh, today. Uh, we're going to be uh, skimming the very surface of this, um, really not going too far into depth of uh, each of the different parts of the brain that we're going to look at. Uh, just understand that you can go uh, much, much deeper in this area. So uh, to start, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how the brain has been um, studied or how we are actually able to measure the brain. Um, it is no simple thing. It is uh, only since the, uh, you know, around the 1920s that we've been able to actually take good looks at what's going on with the brain. Uh, beforehand, you really didn't understand what was going on until the person was dead. Um, we didn't just we just didn't have good access to what was going on in the brain. So uh, first we have the CT scan. Now uh, the CT scan or the CAT scan um, is basically a series of X-ray photographs um, that are taken at um, different angles, um, processed by a computer. And uh, what this allows us to do is it allows us to basically take off parts of the head visually. Um, so that you can see different areas of the brain. So um, what you see in this picture over here on the left hand side uh, doesn't really look like much of a brain and basically what's happened is um, you are placed in a uh, sliding like table okay and, and there's this big dome and you go inside and what it's going to do is it's going to take slices of your brain um, and take taking different pictures of them. So here, uh, this is a top-down view of the brain with basically a big part of it uh, uh, sliced off. And so what you can do is you can get different cuts of the brain. Now, one of the things that we just noted is that it's not a great picture of what the brain actually looks like. Um, it kind of just looks like a kiwi fruit or something of that nature. Um, but the CT scan is still often used because what it's um, good at doing is um, it's good at picking up brain damage. So we can see here in the picture on the right with the A and B, A and B section is you have the little discoloration over here, and I've just kind of marked over it, um, a discoloration here on the left uh, in the left hemisphere of the brain. And uh, what you can see is this is a cut that's kind of up here on the top portion of the head. And so they, we move the person a little bit further along the track, take another cut that's a little bit lower, and then very easily you're able to see this uh, mass of uh, discoloration, uh, very likely just a tumor. And um, you don't need some of the higher end technology to see that we've got a big problem here that the person needs to go and uh, you know, get checked out. So that's a CT scan. Um, you will most often see this done after uh, someone gets in a car wreck or has some sort of brain injury. This is very often the first thing um, to check to see if there's any like gross or major um, brain damage in the region. So next we have the EEG, also known as the electroencephalogram. So the, this was the first bit of technology used to uh, understand what was going on with the brain. Um, so this is a, um, a brain scanner that is more about brain activity and less about what the brain actually looks like. So you've got all these stickers on your head and what it's going to do, it's going to um, uh, recognize and pick up brain waves that travel across the surface of your brain. Um, basically just all the neural activity that's going um, along all that electric, all those electrical currents, um, and so it's just going to pick up all the changes of those activities. Uh, you can see on the left hand side, it looks a lot like a um, Richter scale or a lie detector test, and so you have the different, you know, the different markings. Um, the higher the activity, the more frantic um, it's going to uh, to look. So um, uh, EGs are really good because they're cheap. Um, we often use them for sleep studies. Um, they are not so great because you, you know you don't actually get a picture of the brain. Um, uh, so you know it's specific thing, things that it's used for. And lastly, it's really non-invasive. Um, so you can put this on research subjects that um, won't be able to hold still like babies or things like that. So um, 
it has its uses. It's not for every for every situation, but EEGs are great. Um, and you'll often, like I said, see them in sleep studies. Okay, so next we have the MRI. Uh, now the MRI is uh, going to be using magnetic fields and radio waves. Um, this is going to create images that help us uh, recognize the different soft tissues uh, within the brain that do allow us to see the different, you know, the different uh, parts of it, the different structures. Um, so uh, you see on the right hand side, you can see the, um, the gyra or the folds of the cerebral cortex. Uh, you can see the brainstem, the cerebellum. Um, so you get to see a lot of the different parts of uh, the brain. MRIs are also used for other different body parts. If you hurt your leg or uh, your knee, something like that, it allows us to see those different tissues. So it um, gives us a really good look at what our uh, brain is doing. Um, you know, you get uh, you get to see different dimensions. Um, you don't have to do anything specific with the patient. You really just kind of bring them in, get them going. Um, however, it's really expensive. Um, and while it um, you know is is really great, once again, you're going to need uh, patients that are able to lie still and not move around. Uh, you'll see this a lot with. Uh, young children, you know, they can't do stuff like this because they're not going to be able to stay still for the 30 to 45 minutes it takes to, um, uh, to, do, to do this um, process. So next we have the fMRI. So the fMRI is basically just the MRI plus. You take your MRI and you kind of go to that next step. It's multiple MRIs that are taken in a row. This is called a functional MRI. Um, so the fMRI is once again uh, more interested in brain activity than looking at the structure of the brain. Um, so think of this like the EEG, uh, where we're trying to see what's going on uh, with the brain. So basically what the fMRI is going to do is it's going to help us look at um, uh, where blood flow is like traveling around in the brain. So you'll see um, on the left hand side these really dark, these red areas are where the, br uh, the brain is most active. So on the right hand side picture, what you'll see is the different areas of the brain that light up when you do specific things. So you can have someone start talking. So like in an MRI, the person will just be laying flat doing nothing. But with an fMRI, uh, they might be playing a game or talking to a person or doing something specific. You can see on the right hand side, they just wanted the person to tap their finger and this specific part of the brain lit up and uh, we know that it's connected to that part, specifically their left, uh, one of their left uh, fingers. Um, so fMRI is great. Uh, it is uh, really expensive, um, but this is a great way of seeing what is going on within the brain. And it's doing that by studying the, the blood flow. Where is the blood going and uh, measuring you know, where that is and allowing us to see what's going on. So last and certainly not least, we have the PET scan. Uh, the PET scan, uh, we have the patient injected with uh, radioactive glucose. Um, that radioactive glucose gets into the bloodstream. So just like the MRI, it gets into the bloodstream. Um, and that is what the PET scan is going to measure. So once again, just like the fMRI, the person's going to be active. They're going to be doing something. And um, uh, the positron emission tomography scanner is going to pick up that activity within the brain uh, because it's going to be looking at where that glucose is going. Uh, so over here on the left hand side, uh, you can see that the outer portions of this are very active. Basically, they've just asked this person some memory questions. Um, same thing for someone with mild cognitive impairment. They've asked him some memory questions. You can see the darker areas where they're really struggling. And uh, the far right one, you have this big section in the middle, and this is for Alzheimer's patients. Um, uh, and yeah, as you know, for Alzheimer's, as a person that is having difficulty with their memory, um, oftentimes forgetting things generally happens to people who are older. Um, and you can see that there's just a huge gap in where uh, their, you know, some of their uh, memories are stored and their ability to process um, new memories and try to sort things out. Um, same thing over on the right hand side, you can see the PET scan is giving us a good idea. Uh, you have depressed versus non-depressed. 
Um, and for anyone who's dealt with depression before, you kind of understand uh, depression isn't just like, oh, I'm really sad. Depression is um, I just don't have the energy to do almost anything. And, you know, the worse it gets, oftentimes it does lead to sadness. Um, but it's just the energy that it takes to do even the smallest things, get out of bed, have a pleasant conversation with someone can be very, very difficult. Uh, and so it's a real struggle uh, to do some of these really basic things. Great. So we are going to transition into talking about the brain and the different parts of the brain. Uh, once again, we're really just skimming the surface on uh, here. Um, so we are going to start with um, uh, looking at the different sections of the brain. So we have three different major sections that we're going to talk about. We have the old reptilian brain, we have the limbic system, and then we've got the cerebral cortex out here on top. So we're going to talk about each of these individually. Um, and we do this just to kind of give you a evol evolutionary look at how your brain progresses and how your brain changes, um, how our brain is evolutionarily changed over time. Um, and you can kind of see the differences that, you know, separates us from animals and you know, the rest of, rest of uh, animalia. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the brainstem. And as part of the brainstem, we have the pons and the medulla oblongata. They're basically part of the brainstem. Um, there are specific areas of it. Um, so simply put, uh, the way that I would try to remember this is that the brainstem is all about uh, automatic survival functions. This is basically what is keeping you alive, and it is, these are things that you don't really have to think about. Um, so if you go to the notes section on, um, on this, you'll be able to see all of the different uh, major functions of the pons and the medulla oblongata. It's a long laundry list, but just think of it this way. These different parts of your brain do the specific things that keep you alive, and they're the things that you don't really have to think about. Um, so it helps regulate your uh, sleep cycles. It helps regulate. They help regulate your um, ability to breathe, your ability to, um, your or your heart's ability to beat. Um, they help with uh, the pond specifically helps with swallowing and bladder control. Um, your medulla oblongata helps with um, your ability to vomit, um, your uh, ability to breathe, your heart rate. So all this stuff kind of gets like wrapped up together. So when you're looking at an AP exam question, you really just want to look for, is this an automatic function? Something I'm not going to think about or don't even know how to think about or how, you know, how do you think about like, breathing better, well not breathing, it's not a great example, but like your heart beating faster um, or the your uh, body temperature, there's a lot of stuff you can't, you just do automatically. Um, and then is it helping you stay alive? And generally speaking, it's going to be either the brain, the pons, or the medulla oblongata. And usually in a test question, those will be by themselves without the other two. So uh, easy to kind of pick, oh, well, it's helping stay alive, it's keeping me uh, it's something you don't have to think about. Is the brain, pons, or medulla oblongata an option? So next we have the reticular formation. So the reticular formation sits in the back part of the um, uh, brainstem. So think of it just kind of like a pancake or a tortilla. It just lays on the back side of the reticular formation. Um, its job is to help control our arousal. Um, and when I uh, say arousal, what I'm really looking at is I'm looking at um, uh, not the way that we feel uh, about uh, Michael B. Jordan or Zac Efron. Uh, that's not what we're looking at when we're talking about arousal. When we're talking about arousal, we are looking at um, how awake or alert we are in a specific situation. So not the warm fuzzies we feel for Michael B. Jordan and Zac Efron, but how awake and alert we are. So next we have the thalamus. Uh, so the thalamus uh, works like this. Your brain's got to communicate with itself. Um, so certain parts of the brain do different things. So you have something like the occipital lobe here in the back uh, that processes your vision. Um, and you have one of the association areas up here uh, deals specifically with recognizing faces. So if our eyes see something, something comes in from our eyeballs, comes back, it's going to go to the occipital lobe. It's going to process that information inside the occipital lobe. Um, just say you're running into a friend 
um, that you haven't seen in a while, you recognize their face. That information is going to go from the occipital lobe to the thalamus. The thalamus is going to be like, oh, I know what part of the brain um, uh, allows us to recognize that stuff. So it's going to send us to the association area. And then that association area is going to be allow, allow us to recognize the specific face. And we're going to know who that person is, who that friend is, or whatever um, that you know. So that's the thalamus. Basically, it just, um, if your brain wants to communicate with itself, with a different part of the brain, it's got to go through the thalamus. And it's going to direct that, that information. Think of it like Grand Central Station in New, in New York. That's what the thalamus is for. So last and certainly not least, we have the cerebellum. So the cerebellum is, sits on the back end of the uh, brain, kind of right above the brainstem and right under the cerebral cortex, kind of looks like a little brain to itself. And its job is to control voluntary movement. So think of um, your ability to walk. You don't really have to think about that. You just do it. Your ability to write, uh, your ability to jump, um, all of these things are uh, taken over by the cerebellum. Um, people who play sports or dance um, or uh, know how to play music, um, a good portion of your work, especially the better you get, the less you have to think about. And so the more the cerebellum is um, going to take over. So uh, for those of you who play different instruments and know different chords or uh, different tones or how to, how to make those, um, especially if you've been doing for, for a while, you don't have to think about where you need to place your keys or where your, uh, your fingers when you're making those uh, different sounds. It's just something that you know, um, and that is because the cerebellum has taken control and allows you to you know, play the guitar a certain way or to play the piano or what it, whatever it is that you're doing. So now that we are out of the reptilian brain, think about um, what the reptilian brain is all about. It's about staying alive and doing kind of the basic stuff that you need in order to stay alive. Um, so most fish and reptiles, that's about as far as their brain goes. Um, they don't really uh, deal with any emotions. They don't have the capacity to do so. All they're looking to do is stay alive. So that's what they focus on. So now we're going to move a little bit higher up uh, on the food chain, a little bit higher up on the um, evolutionary scale. We'll look at the limbic system. Limbic system mostly deals with uh, different types of emotions and allows us to experience those emotions. So first things first, we're going to do something, uh, go with something really simple, the amygdala. So the amygdala are these little um, P-shaped uh, pods that sit at the end of the hippocampus. And uh, basically, um, they are strongly linked with the emotions, specifically the emotion of fear and aggression. Um, so uh, they also help a little bit with memory consolidation. You'll see that as they are attached to the hippocampus. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, the ability to feel fear and to uh, recognize that or aggression, uh, a lot of that is tied to the amygdala. So um, you can have people who have had brain damage to specifically the amygdala area showing no fear or always afraid or always aggressive or, you know, never, you know, uh, just constantly passive. That is what the amygdala is in charge of fear, aggression. Next, you have the hippocampus. Uh, the hippocampus also helps us consolidate in information. Uh, basically, our processing of short-term to long-term memory happens in the hippocampus. So your ability to um, learn someone's name and then hold on to that information, you know, for you know for a week, and then a week later you run into that person again, and being able to be like, ah, you're this person. That's what your hippocampus is doing. Um, or your hippocampus's ability to remember itself. Um, right now, your hippocampus is trying to uh, take that short-term information that you were just learning now and transfer it to long-term so you can hold on to it for a much period of time. Um, so you can you know, use it on a test or something like that. That's the hippocampus. Okay, so next we have the uh, hypothalamus. Uh, so the hypothalamus does uh, several things. Um, it helps with uh, certain maintenance, maintenance activities, such as helping us um, with our eating, with our drinking, with our body temperature. It is also uh, the kind of the brain of the endocrine system. It tells, tell the diff tells the different parts of the endocrine system what to do. Uses the pituitary gland to do that. Doesn't actually, the uh, hypothalamus doesn't secrete its own whole, 
its own hormones. It uh, tells the pituitary gland what uh, hormones to release, and that goes to the other hormones and the, or the other glands, and they release those types of hormones. Uh, lastly, it is um, uh, linked with the emotion of feeling rewarded. So when you um, have worked really hard at something, you've accomplished it, you've done a really good job, and that, oh yes, that fist pumping, like, yes, feeling uh, that you get when you succeed at something, uh, that is what you are going to, that is the, the job of the hypothalamus is to help you, uh, you know, uh, is part of that is your, your feeling uh, come, stems from the hypothalamus. When you're looking at a PET scan, that part of the brain is very, very active. Okay, so next we have the pituitary gland. Um, pituitary gland um, is also part of the endocrine system. It helps the hypothalamus communicate with the rest of the parts of the endocrine system. Um, and one of the other major things that it does is it helps control and regulate uh, human growth, physical growth. So your ability to get bigger um, happens uh, with the endocrine system, most often quite active at night. So your ability to grow, get bigger, part of the pituitary gland. So uh, we are moving to the final stage, of the final level of the uh, brain. Uh, we're going to take a look at the cerebral cortex. This is the outer layer of the brain. This is kind of the part of the brain that you think about. The cerebral cortex takes uh, over 80% of our brain um, uh, weight and mass. Um, and uh, this is really what separates us from animals. It's like the, you know, this is a higher order functioning. This is this is where it's really at. So uh, we're just going to talk about four different lobes of the brain. Um, keep this very simple. Um, we're not going to talk about all of like this, you know, the specifics inside. Uh, if you ever take a class on the brain um, in biology or you know later in psychology, we'll, they'll go way more in depth. But we'll we'll just keep it to the basics. So four different lobes of the brain. The first is the occipital lobe, and as you can see, it is in charge of processing the things that we see. Um, this is what allows us to recognize the third dimension. Our eyes see the world in 2D. When it processes it, when it sends that information back to the occipital lobe, it allows us to recognize depth, how far something away is. Um, so that's the occipital lobe in charge of processing vision. Next, you have the temporal lobe. Um, it's on the sides of your, your brain, on the, the left and the right. Um, and its job is to process our hearing, is our ability to recognize different people's voices, recognize different songs, different tones. All of that is processed uh, within the brain. Uh, next, we have the parietal lobe, which sits at the back top half of the brain. And the parietal lobe's job is to help with our sense of touch, our ability to recognize um, uh, different uh, surfaces and like different textures and what is the difference between them, uh, what is rough and smooth. That's the parietal lobe. And then finally, we have the frontal lobe. So the frontal lobe sits on the front half of the brain. And very simply, it uh, is the last part of the brain that is developed. Uh, your brain doesn't finish developing until you're about 25 years of age. Um, so the frontal lobe helps with fine motor movement. So your ability to like play a difficult instrument or um, to sew, all of that uh, is in the frontal lobe. It is also in charge of um, planning and judgment. So making decisions on what you should do or thinking ahead. And finally, it helps regulate our emotions. Um, so the feelings that we have, like, you know, making sure that they don't go overboard, that they are under control, that is the frontal lobe. And so if you think about teenagers and a lot of the issues that they do have, um, you will see that the frontal lobe is a big part of that. Um, the fact or the fact that it hasn't fully formed is a big part of who they are and why they do the things that they do. Okay, so this is uh, your brain, um, all the different parts of it. Uh, be sure if you have any questions to ask me, but otherwise, good work everyone and we'll have a good day.